Hi, are you sick and tired of paying hundreds of dollars a month for cable or dish? GNR TV is your answer. These guys have an incredible 100% legal product that is a cord cutter's dream. For as low as $25 a month, you will get over 400 HD channels, including all major sports packages, pay-per-views, premium movies, and entertainment. To get started, all you need is a streaming device, such as an Amazon Fire Stick, internet, and a desire to save a ton of cash. No contracts, no credit checks, no hidden fees. I myself have been a subscriber, and I must say, this service is amazing. To learn more, search GNR TV on Facebook or Instagram, and I will also be posting a link on my pages to check out on my podcast website. Lastly, for first-time subscribers, use promo code SIRS30 to save $5 for your first month. GNR TV, streaming done right. Let's get slicing and dicing with Sir Sturdy Horror fans. On this podcast, you will hear me and a guest do some movie reviews, random funny horror chats, and whatever else comes to mind. So tune in, kick back, relax, and always remember, I'll see you in your nightmares. Well, this Jason's mask. How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another awesome, exciting episode of Horror with Sir Sturdy. I'm your host, Sir Sturdy. I got my co-host, Henry. And we got the great Tom McGoffin from Friday the 13th Director, Part 6, Jason Lives. Tom, how's it going? The best one. It's going great. Hello to everybody from lovely, sunny, warm Hollywood, California. <laughs> nice. Henry, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing I'm doing good. Nice and hot here in Denver, Colorado. It's actually not too bad weather-wise over here in Schenectady, New York. It's decent. It's, that's where dreams are made, in Schenectady. Yeah, you're right about that. <laughs> but Tom, thank you again. I know I just told you this, but thank you so much for coming on. Huge, huge Friday the 13th fan. Best franchise, hands down. And I'm just happy to have you on. It's awesome. Oh, um, Thank you. It's my pleasure. You know, always love talking about the movie and, you know, kind of keeping you guys up to the craziness that's my world. <laughs> so I'm sure it's interesting. Oh, yeah. So do you have any, um, what updates do you have for us, for us horror fans? Well, I guess the big news that's been floating around for the last, uh, I guess about a month now, uh, is the fact that I've written a new Friday the 13th called Jason Never Dies, and um, it takes place for the first time in the uh, winter, in the snow. Uh, it's basically a female cast uh, set in 1999, and um, it's going to be a little different from other Fridays for a couple of different reasons in terms of what I'm doing with the situation, but it's going to be classic, standard 1980s, 90s, Friday the 13th, and that it all takes place in those Crystal Lake woods, and um, it's going to kind of deliver, I think, some some new surprises, um, and uh, hopefully, you know, have the same sort of dark humor that I have Jason Lives. <laughs> yeah. So, you said all female, well, female, mostly female cast, correct? All female, yeah. All the female only, cast. The only dude is Jason. Okay. Are there going to be any returning characters from other movies? Well, um, that's one of the things that's going to be a surprise in the in the uh, particular script. Um, the, and hope, hopefully will be a movie once this uh, lawsuit okay. settles down. But yeah, I do yeah. have kind of, a, kind of a surprise thing that happens uh, towards the end of the, of, the, of the film. Is there any... <laughs> Is there any positive updates on the um, this lawsuit? I wish I could say there was something. Um, there was there was word about two months ago that supposedly in September they were going to have some sort of deadline that I think Victor Miller had to meet, and I don't even know what that is exactly. Um, 
this uh, upcoming Friday the 13th of September. Um, Which is my birthday, but Blairstown and uh, at the museum, the Friday the 13th Museum, and we're going to be doing uh, a pre world premiere of Friday the 13th Vengeance, which is a fan film, you know, that uh, I'm a part of, you know, that I have a little cameo that I do in it, and I also kind of added, uh, added a few ideas in post, uh, in terms of like a film consultant, and Victor Miller is going to be uh, being interviewed, um, you know, over, uh, I don't know, Skype or something, so uh, I would sure love to hear him say something about, you know, what's the state of affairs, or, or maybe he can't because of the, of the legal aspect of it that's awesome i actually heard some stuff about the blairstown museum thing i had a guy on last week i recorded with him his name was i forgot his last name but his name's brian and uh -huh. he's, he's a big part of that and he knows the he knows the lady that's running it i'm actually gonna have them on tonight to talk about that which is awesome about the blairstown oh, that's museum great. thing and the whole vengeance thing which i just i think it's awesome because you know, the original was recorded there, and it has a lot of the old setting. It has, I guess, the town, it's a small town. I guess it still looks the same from the movie fairly. Some parts yeah. more up-to-date, which I think is amazing. So that's really cool. Yeah, Vengeance, it seems to be uh, gathering a lot of steam. A lot of people are interested in it, and it looks great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's going to be a real, a real like, great celebration of, of the franchise. Um, set in the obviously perfect locale. I'm really anxious to see what this museum's all about. Um, and uh, it's going to, you know, have, you know, two of the Jasons, the one from uh, the Vengeance, um, Jason Brooks, and then C.J. Graham, who is my Jason in Friday the 13th, and is also playing Jason's father in Vengeance. He is so, a beast uh, of a man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we met him... Um, what, three summers ago, Aaron? In New Jersey? Yep. Monster Mania. Yeah. Yeah, really nice guy. Do you ever yeah. do, do you ever do horror conventions, Tom? I've only done a few, and that's not from choice. Um, you know, I would love to do more of them, but there seems to be, like, you know, the fan base is incredible. I mean, when I do do them, it's, you know, it, I, I really find so many people that are so happy to have me show up so they can have their book signed, you know, their, uh, uh, what, what do you call it? The, um, Crystal Lake memoirs book or, you know, anything, <laughs> posters, whatever, they're create, you know, trying to get as many uh, autographs on there as possible. So they're very happy in that regard, but the actual bookers, I just think they're not as, uh, you know, savvy about, you know, having the writer direct come out. It's usually always just the actors. So, um, you know, now that I'm acting in one of them, I'm, maybe I'll be a little more in demand. I don't know. I'm going to uh, – there's a con that we go to. We've been going to for the past maybe five or six years, and I have the guy who runs the con on my podcast every year. So, well, I've, I've started the podcast last year, so I only had him on twice so far. But I'm going to talk to him and tell him we need you at ScareCon in Rochester one year or in uh, Massachusetts because – you're a very important person in this Friday the 13th franchise, and you made an amazing freaking movie. You deserve it. Yeah, and Jason Lives is, well, my personal favorite, but, um, you know, it's it's a popular one. I mean, they're all pretty popular, but, you know, like they just, uh, NECA just released a Jason Lives, Jason, what, what three months ago? Yeah. I yeah. So. Something yeah. like that, yeah. I mean, no one is more surprised about this than me, guys. I mean, I, I when I when I made it, I was afraid that there was going to be some blowback over the fact of the humor, um, you know, aspect of it, and that I was kind of, you know, doing a satirization of of the franchise. No, well, not necessarily just the franchise, but slasher movies in in general, um, you know, with certain lines and stuff. But at the, the same time, release, yeah. over the years, it, like it's it has maintained its popularity and in some ways it's more popular now than it ever was before and i'm i don't know what it is exactly i mean i want to think because i tried to make a better movie with it um rather than just you know a, a kind of a crazy series of kills mm -hmm. that get you know i had tommy had a real agenda uh, throughout <laughs> the movie yeah. and so did tommy Jason. Harris. yep so were, were you a fan of the franchise before you directed the movie? I was a fan of the first movie. 
Um, I saw okay. that and I thought it was great. And the, the rest of them, to be honest, I had not seen um, okay. until I got the job. And that wasn't because I was purposely trying to avoid them or anything. It was just we had so many horror movies. You know, I was I was trying to, you know, get on to my next movie after I did One Dark Night. And all I was getting was, well, if you can come up with something that's a slasher movie, you know, we'll be interested. And I go, well, you know, I want to come up with something that's truly, you know, unique. I don't want to just copy all the rest of them because you could literally make a deal here in Hollywood with a, a producer if you had... Uh, a killer with some sort of something that covered his face, you know, mm-hmm. set in the woods or cabin or some isolation. Because that's what was hot. And lots of girls to kill. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, of course. Blood, guts, and boobs. That's what sells. Oh, yeah. That's what, yeah. I remember, I remember watching uh, Jason Lives on Monster Vision with Joe Bob Briggs. Yeah. I, that was the first time I, I'd ever seen the movie. And I just remember watching in the beginning. When Tommy is, is stabbing Jason, his cor- maggot-fested corpse, mm-hmm. with that metal rod. And uh-huh. then as soon as the lightning struck, I'm like, oh, man, here we go. Like, I knew he was going to come back, obviously, somehow. But, I mean, come on. If he had just left him alone, everything would have been all right. Exactly, yeah. Jason, Jason was very happy to have some peace, finally. And, uh, you know, and he even had a great mark. Mess it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, when what direction? I mean, obviously... You know, there was the, the little bit of humor in it, but, like, what, what direction did you want to take the film? Like, what, what well, was your thoughts coming in? Basically, when I was hired, Frank Mancuso Jr., who was the executive that, you know, oversaw all those films at Paramount, he, he, all he said to me is, bring back Jason. I don't care how you do it, figure it out. And I said, well, I'd love to add some element of humor to it. And uh, he said, yeah, just don't make fun of Jason. And then the rest of it was up to me. So I, I was very, very blessed to have, you know, almost total creative freedom with it. Right. I say almost because every so often there'll be, you know, somebody else's idea. And I go, that's a much better idea. Let's use that. But at least I had, you know, the, the ability to, you know, listen and bring other things in if I thought they were better than mine. And then, you know, we got down to the later part. Um, we had a screening and Frank after the screening, which was just wild. I mean, the audience, I've never, ever had an audience that was so noisy through the entire movie, you couldn't even hear the dialogue. But Frank said, we need three more kills. And I go, are you kidding? We got 13. He goes, no, we need three more. So, you know, that was one thing that got added. And then he also came to me and said, what do you think about Alice Cooper? I said, I love Alice Cooper. He said, we're going to see if we can get his music in the movie. So those are the you know two big things that Frank kind of yeah. added to the to the end, but um, in the end part of, of production. But the the actual movie itself, um, my main objective was to set up characters that you liked, you know, that had some kind of a you know sense of humor and bonding and a little bit of family aspect to them. And then when they got killed, you kind of were like, oh, guy, I like that. That's you nice. know? Yeah. And, uh, yep. So you know, so that the kills really meant something, and that there was sort of equal amount of guys getting killed as there was girls. So it really was about Jason going after Tommy, and anybody that you know just happens to be in his way, you know, is dead meat. Yeah, just like in the, in the other movies, he would just kill people that you know came to the camp. But with this movie, he had he had a purpose, he had a you know mission, so to speak. Yeah, I've and, got uh, so. Thing. I have a very similar thing on my other one. Oh, the, the one, the script I just did that has a has an agenda for it. Well, so uh, as far as the, the the casting, did you have any uh, say in that? Because casting um, is it is it pronounced Tom or Tom? Yeah, I, I that that was another one of those areas <laughs> I had total control as director. That uh, awesome, had a great you know casting director. Um, champion and uh, they just um, did an, an amazing job of bringing in people that were just fresh up and coming you know they were the ones who brought in uh, Tom Matthews and you know I instantly loved him Jennifer Cook there were so many yeah. just great great um, you know young up and coming actors that were part of yeah, it. Yeah he was in um, the you know the return of the living dead one and two and then you know and then this one and then this was Tony so was, Goldwyn's uh, first 
uh, Screen Actors Guild movie. Um, so he got his Screen Actors Guild card, and of course, he went on to Ghost and so many other great projects. Yep. Were you a fan of, um, did you see Never Hike Alone, that fan film? Yeah, I did. Um, I, and I thought Vincent did a really wonderful job. I'm, I'm, I'm really in awe of these fan films. You know, I've seen a number of them that come out. Um, and it's like, you know, with just a you know, little technical ability, but lots of passion and heart, they go at these things and come up with some pretty, you know, amazing ideas. And I, I don't know if any other film series or franchise ever had this many imitations of, of, you know, because they're frustrated that they don't have the real thing. Yeah. They're just making them themselves. Um, yeah. But I, I, you know, I, I, you can't go off and do a James Bond movie or a Star Trek movie, you know, without a hell of a budget, That's but true. these are relatively yeah. easy to shoot. And, you know, so, and then the, it's all about the invention, you know, how clever they are. And like with, I know with, Vengeance, you know, they've got some really interesting twists in there and some interesting ideas with it being Tommy Jarvis's kids that are out looking for their dad and then Jason Bollard involved with it too. Nice. nice. Okay. I didn't even know that. That would be very it's awesome to see. Yeah. So, um, for, for uh, Jason Lives, the set locations, was this like, was this done in Hollywood or was this... No, that was done in uh, in Georgia, um, Covington, Georgia, is where we okay. uh, were were centered, and that's where we did the town. And then we drove about an hour um, out into the woods where there was a uh, camp, Daniel Morgan, which still stands today and still looks exactly the same. And the Friday the Thirteenth, that was going to be the next one that got the plug pulled on it. They were going to actually shoot at that same camp. Um, because it looks so much the same. And they just did something really cool. I wish I would have been a part of it. It would have <laughs> sent me a plane ticket because I would have been there in a heartbeat. But they had like a Friday the 13th Jason Lives weekend where people paid to come and actually stay at the camp. They showed the movie, you know, like on one of those big blow-up screens. Yeah, you know, awesome. All the camping type things, you know. And, you know, it just sounded like a blast. I saw a picture of everybody, you know, kind of gathered around by the lake. And it just looked like it must have been so much fun to have been part of that. That sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Time, I mean. Just like how they did the Jaws videos by like a lake or like in a pool or something like that. Yeah. Now, Henry, do you remember when yes. um, I got these DVDs when they first came out? <laughs> yeah. I don't remember how old we were. We had to be at least, I want to say 17 because you have to be a certain age to be able to buy the R-rated movies. And when these yeah. DVDs first came out, we went. We took a bus to Fye. Went there, grabbed the. We either took a bus or got a ride. That part I don't remember. Got these movies, and we literally off of Red Bull and candy. We watched these movies throughout the whole freaking weekend. From and I believe it happened to be Friday the Thirteenth that weekend. So we watched it from that Probably, Friday yeah. to that yeah, I, Sunday. And I just, it's been like a a tradition that we've been doing. From I mean, we don't do it together anymore, but we'll get together. Like, hey, it's Friday the Thirteenth. What Jason are you watching? And we've been doing that yep. for years, and it's just. It's so awesome how this franchise does that. Well, I love, I love it. So it's about caffeine and sugar to, to, to get through them and, and be there. Because I never understood yeah. the principle of a six pack and a joint. Um, how, how are you going to stay awake that long? <laughs> You're going to fall asleep at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Probably going to giggle a little bit and then fall asleep. Yep, yep. <laughs> Which I've done that too, but I was too. Yeah. You know, we weren't doing that at the time, so you know, we had to do the candy and the, <laughs> yeah, exactly. the candy and the Red Bull. Yeah. Yeah, I just remember uh, how I, I don't know if they do it anymore, but every Friday the Thirteenth, it would either be it used to be USA, yep. and then um, I think it was just USA, wasn't it? That had oh may, maybe the Sci Fi Channel, but when we were kids, the Sci Fi Channel wasn't a thing. Yeah. And uh, you know they would do the you know marathons, you know one through which you know whichever one they were at at the time. And, and yeah, just, I just I, more. I think. I think Cinemax right now has been running them pretty consistently, and uh, okay. some other station. Um, it's not uh, TMC. It's, uh, one one of the other stations, you know, will run them literally back to back on certain weekends, which is really cool. So it's, yeah, this year my my birthday falls on Friday the thirteenth. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. 
That's great. My my thirteenth birthday was also on Friday the thirteenth. Wow. Don't yeah. I heard you remember that. Yeah. <laughs> we rented we rented um Jason movies, we rented um Halloween. I remember we rented Halloween. Is that the is that the birthday you spit on the carpet? Spit the orange soda on the carpet? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is more information than I need to know, guys. <laughs> it was a child, childhood thing, saying something crazy, yeah. probably, and laughing. But, yeah, um, of course. I but uh, going back to your uh, your script for the new film, I, li- I like the idea of it being set in, in uh, winter because every hollow, every most you know horror movies in general really aren't set you know in the winter. It's mostly summertime. Or fall. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, part of it, and I'm gonna live to regret this when they get the picture made, is it's really hard to shoot in the snow. Uh, I mean, there are parts that goes without saying the uncomfort of, of just you're freezing and you're drive, trying to stay warm while you're standing out there for long hours, you know, which is tough. The other thing is, is that it's really unpredictable to schedule. You know, we're gonna do it this week and hope that there's gonna be snow that looks decent or hasn't, you know, melted. Um, and then if it's like too much snow, then you can't shoot because it's just, you know, overly packed in. And, and so production wise, it becomes a very difficult thing to do. But at the same time, I wanted this Friday, like my Jason lives to be different from anything that's come before. And that was something that I thought, well, it's been talked about for years. And interesting enough, since I've announced this, there's been a couple of other fan films that are embracing that idea of a winter thing so they're obviously going to beat me to the punch um but it's like to me i don't think they're going to be doing it in the same way that i'm going to be doing it and it's just like saying well you know you're going to shoot it in a forest it's like okay yeah that's where you do these things and in my case it's like i'm going to try to find elements that are a part of it also being in the winter so it's not just the fact that you know, you're at the camp and it's winter time. And why are there campers there? Now, well, in my case, they're not campers. They're something else. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. This is, you know, these are all the things that, you know, you, you, tr- you know, when you, when you write, you try to come up with and see if you can make, you know, these new ideas somehow work and feel logical with the story. Yeah, and, you know, and the gore will look great on the snow. Oh, so, yeah. You know, there's that. Oh, yeah, red. <laughs> Yeah, yeah dragging, right. dragging a body would leave a very interesting trail. Mm-hmm. Big footprints. You could maybe use an icicle, you know, as a murder weapon or something, you know. Or I'll I'll, I'll remain quiet on that uh, comment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. But yeah, the, the the big difference between that is you can use, you know, the element to your advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. I'm just, I've been saying this for, I can't tell you how many years, actually me and her have been discussing this, it would be so awesome to see a Friday the 13th movie in the winter, and I'm like, people do go camping in the winter, hiking and all that kind of stuff or whatever. So I go ice fishing, so, ice fishing, you know, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I hope this, finally, I hope, once this lawsuit's over, hopefully this lawsuit's over soon and we get to see another amazing Friday the 13th film. Because yeah, I had to want it, you know? Yeah. We do. Yeah, it's been going on nine years now. It's just Jesus. Block has been All the money that could have been made. I know. I know. It's hard to believe. I mean, you had the, the fan-made video game, which is awesome. You know, yeah. and, and these days, you don't even need, you know, a big studio or, you know, all that. You get the fans, you do like a, the, you know, the, the campaigns, and you have the fans invest in it. Because, oh, you know, that's, that's what people want to see, you know? And that's- yeah. One thing with that, being a fan of horror and then having this podcast, what I've noticed in general, and I know you can agree to this, Henry, is like, as fans of these type of things, like with the Indiegogos and all that, or just like when, when say, like you guys as the directors or other podcasts have like a poll and they let the fans answer these questions or join these campaigns, we like to be a part of that kind of stuff. Like, it's like, hey, I was a part of this. I was a part of this. I might have been a small part, my little $25, $30. To get me this break for this for this Kickstarter, but I was a part of this. My name's in the credits. You know, thank you, Aaron, for whatever. You know, thank you, Aaron. And then this movie's gonna come out that you really wanted to see in the first, anyways. So it's just yeah, it's cool. It's not like yeah. it's, it's not like it's just one of those things where we're just 
throwing money at something and somebody's pocketing the money or there's no little thank yous or there's no nothing coming from like you're getting something we're getting something from it too but not only are we getting an awesome movie but we're also getting a blu-ray a poster something autographed whatever you know whatever the case may be which I yeah think is awesome. the incentives are probably one of the coolest things about a lot of these uh you know th- you know funded things is they come up with really cool incentives and one of them that they had for uh, vengeance is that you know you put in and I can't remember what the amount of money was, but you put in X amount of money, you get to be in the movie and you get to be killed by Jason. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, if I had the money, I'd be in all those movies. <laughs> you and me both. Yeah, and the amazing thing is, some of these guys who are totally not actors or guys and and women really did a good job. I was like amazed. I thought you know the the acting would be very wooden and you know afraid, but um, Jeremy Brown, who's the uh, director of it, you know has a really light, very light, very warm quality about him. So you know it put everybody at ease. So you know he actually got some very good performances from from non actors. Yeah, and you know, and a lot of the you know independent stuff here, you know, it's. People that grew up watching these movies love these characters, you know, and have invested in them for so long, and then yeah. actually get the opportunity, you know, like whatever your whatever your favorite action movie is, you know, you're never going to be able to be in it. You yeah. know what I mean? Like horror, you're not going to be in Die Hard or whatever, but there's a chance you could be in a Jason movie or you know whatever any other movie, you know, because yeah. like I was saying before, like the fan base is the backbone, oh. you know. Mm-hmm. Well, I got in my critters. Oh, yeah, <laughs> the second Curtis movie, Mickey Argus, yeah, put me in there, and so I got attacked and eaten. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Another claim to fame. Hey. One, one thing that we try to do, Henry and I, like when we go to these horror conventions, is if there's an independent horror movie, you know, some, if they're selling an independent horror movie there, we try to get it. At least, well, at least one of them, because sometimes there's a few vendors, we'll try to get at least one of them and just give them that. Because they worked hard on those movies, so they get give them their money and just check the movie out. And nine times out of ten, they're they're awesome movies. Which I just, yeah. I do. I like how a lot of fans get these chances to put their visions out there as well as other directors. And I just can't. I can't wait to see your next work. Well, thank you. I'm I'm, I'm generally biting at the bit because it's been a number of years, and I've you know kind of done some other creative things like you know I have a rock and roll band called the sloss and uh our first album the sloss from the goonies? back from the grave so it's very much kind of in that slightly horror you know difficult times of being a teenager in terms of the type of songs that it has so that's you know been kind of keeping us busy with you know recording and touring and all that and then i've also been teaching um as an adjunct professor at uh, chapman university dodge college which has really given me an opportunity to stay up with technology and, you know, use the kind of, you know, new toys that keep coming down the the pike here and to work with young filmmakers who, you know, have the same desires and there's amazing how many of them love horror and a lot of them have, you know, graduated from the college and have gone off and, you know, are making horror movies and um, it's, it's, it's an incredible, you know, kind of passing of the baton, but at the same time, I've got another baton that I'm holding yeah. <laughs> that I'm going to continue to carry so I can get, you know, the more, more of these films that I want to do done. Now, with this, um, I'm trying to think what I was going to say. Okay. With your, with your next film, or with the script you have, there's, you can't do that as like a fan-made type of thing, or like an independent thing, movie? No, totally is not. Um, I... I basically created something that really will cost some money to do. And I'm not talking like, you know, a hundred million dollar movie or anything, but it's, it's certainly in that, that area of, you know, probably somewhere between five to 10 million to do it. Um, that'll all be adjusted according to what they ultimately want to spend. But it, you know, the fan films usually top out somewhere around 50 to a hundred thousand. Um, you know, depending on how many they, you know, people, you know, put in. And that's just barely enough to make something, you know, uh, and get a little bit of effects and stuff. But I, I've got very big sequences and also the, the, the whole thing of shooting in, uh, in a, a woods and forest and stuff 
I can only do that so much. And then, then we have to build sets for all the key, you know, interior pieces. So that again, a whole nother cost when you start building sets, but there's kind of no way to get around it. Um, you know, in, in the way I'm thinking of how I want to shoot this thing. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was always wondering stuff like that yeah. with the whole, but you know how the budget and stuff like that works. I never, I never really knew. Yeah, my, location my, alone. Yeah. yeah, my Friday the 13th back in the day, you know, the 85, 86, you know, that was uh, just shy of $3 million. Mm. And some of them, you know, ended up being four or five. But, you know, all the first, you know, slasher movies and Halloween and stuff were, you know, like a million or under. So, you know, and my first movie was under a million dollars too. But things now, it's like either you can make a really cool ultra low budget movie but you just have to you know lose a lot of the bigger type things like sets and things that are more costly to do but you can still make a really scary piece and you know i'm of the belief that you know it's uh, for something to be an art form it's got to be as simple as having you know a pencil and a piece of paper because that's something we can all own but we all can't be an artist and now that with the cell phones and the HD on them, I mean, you know, I mean, Steven Soderbergh just made a movie that was all shot on a cell phone. And, you know, the fans can make some incredible looking stuff with low budget cameras or just off their cell phone. You know, and there's lenses now for that. There's um, stabilizers, stabilizers like steady cams that can be put on those things so it doesn't look like a handheld thing. So, you know. If you have a desire to make a film, there's nothing to get in your way now. You basically have it in your hand right now. That's very true. Yeah, it's just a sign of the times, you know? Yeah. That's very, very true. But there'll be a lot so of films the, uh, that'll be oh, just yeah. really, that, uh, you know, that will come from somebody in the middle of nowhere that just has this passion. And that's what's exciting to me. So the uh, the, special, the the uh, practical effects in part six. Um, what what did you, what did you want to do? Like I love the RV scene. Like that's one of the the that whole sequence really like stands out for me. Um, how did how did that whole thing go about? Uh, all the, you guys all had to the, tip it over and everything. All the different effects, you mean? Yeah. Um, well, we had a, a great guy. Uh, Marty Becker, who, you know, basically was in charge of anything that exploded or, you know, dealt with any kind of visual effect, because uh, everything, you know, obviously was done in camera. Um, and even the pushing uh, Darcy's face through the side of the motor. Yeah, that, the, that the sound, a, sound effects. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, it's the sound effects and the, you know, they made a mold of her face and, put, you know, put the stuff on it so that when it, you know, when they put it down into water, it, it formed um, into that look. And then the rest of it was just, you know, the sound and stuff that they added. Um, any, any of the, you know, the, you know, turning the head and yanking it off. I mean, some of these things really look much more intense in the versions that we first had. And then the motion picture rating board got a hold of it and we ended up, you know, have, losing a lot of, you know, it was frames. There wasn't like any one sequence that was taken out, but, you know, there was just a number of frames that you lose some of the kind of cool, you know, gore aspects that were in there. Like how he ripped the guy's arm off that had the machete? Yeah. Because in the beginning, it makes it look like he's, you know, just has a machete and then it like pans up a little bit and you see the arm hanging off it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's, it's all about point. the presentation, you know, that's, it's like, you know, using the frame for, for, for reasons um, that are discovery and surprises. Um, and it's like constantly trying to, you know, figure this out ahead of time. So on the day, you know, you just kind of execute it like the way Hitchcock did. If you have things storyboarded and planned out um, yeah. so that you knew exactly what you needed. The other thing I really liked was the score. Yeah, Harry Manson is it's the guy, you know, who was, is the, the sound of Friday the 13th. And with mine, I said, you know, I want something that's a little more gothic, that a little more sense of, of, of not necessarily religion, but just, just a, that kind of a timeless, you know, big, um, almost like, uh, 
something that, that would be a classical piece of music. So he, he wove this together in such a way and put some themes in there that really were, I think, wonderful. And, and for him, it was like his best score of all the Fridays. He really loved, you know, what he came up with. And of course, you know, it, especially, um, I'm sorry, like, especially the, uh, the, the, the scene in the beginning, you know, you got the guy fumbling through the forest and then it has almost like that whimsical music, you know, uh, I feel like it, just, it was very, it, the score was very fitting for each scene. Yeah. And in the Jason movies in general, the, the score, I mean, when you hear, you hear that high pitched, what I think is a violin, maybe, Yeah. you know, you know, someone's about to get killed, you know, or yeah. he's about to show up or, you know, they just said the score is more important for this movie than like say any Friday the 13th movie. Well, obviously the, you know, the I mean, original, I'm sorry, <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street movie, I mean. The, the original slasher was really Norman Bates, you know, and what Hitchcock did <laughs> uh, with that shower scene and the violins doing that, <laughs> you know, that's kind of what Yeah, and it's like the very and low, uh, just, you know, is the master, you know, everybody always looks up to him as, you know, the guy that, you know, really started it all. And for him, did he like watch the movie and then, you know, before it was shown in theaters and then um, made up the score based on that? Or like, how does that work? Yeah, that's all part of post-production. Um, yeah, once okay. I finished the edit and we went through all the, you know, we we have a temp score. You know, we, we take music that was from other Friday the 13th and put it in here and there, you know, so we got a, a sense of what the movie's going to feel like. And then we actually use like the Alice Cooper songs in there, and then we're fortunate enough to get them. Um, yep. And then once once we finally pass the ratings boards, then we give the turn the film over to Harry, and I'll sit there with him and talk about you know let's have music here, let's keep this one silent. You know, we we kind of decide where the music's going to be, and then 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 he goes off and composes to those images and to those sequences. Okay. And then we'll play That's stuff back and say, you know, do you like this? Do you think it should be bigger? Do you think it should be smaller? Do you think it should be lower? You know, it, all that stuff is kind of worked out between the director and the composer. Okay. And would you be doing that same thing with your new script? Yeah. It would okay. yeah, it would be that same. Well, the whole the whole job of being a director is you're kind of like the little queen bee that flies, you know, flies around and pollinates things and try to make sure everything is on course but you can't you can't do it without an army of people you know you, you right. obviously in this case I've written it so I know what I want as a director but then there's got to be a producer that you have to collaborate with there's got to be a cameraman you know sound department special effects department when the picture's over the color timing of it so that it has the right look to it you know editor i mean there's so many other people that get involved with it but again the director's job is to kind of go from department to department and try to keep that vision you know that you, you have uh, alive yeah so you basically have your hands in just about everything pretty much now do you have anyone in particular that you would like to work with with this project um yeah well the only person that i talk about is cj graham you know who did jason um, yeah. When I was writing this, because I've been friends with him all these years, I, I couldn't help but imagine him doing the part. Now, at the same time, Kane Hodder, I think it's an amazing Jason, and I think that he's brought to it. So if there was some yeah. reason that, you know, CJ couldn't do it, um, you know, Kane Hodder would be my next go-to guy. Because I'd love to have people that have already been part of, you know, doing Jason. Not that the new guys haven't done a great job, there's no question, and, and I think... Jason Brooks, who's in uh, Vengeance, has done a really great job too. But there is that thing I think of trying to, you know, get you know Harry to do the music and somebody who's done Jason before to do Jason, and then the rest of the cast is basically going to be, you know, new new faces and un, un, mm -hmm. unknown. Up and covers. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, now, and for you, you know, that'll add some like nostalgia for you, you know, back to Part Six if you were to get, you know, CJ. Yeah. Well, that, that, it was a lot of fun in uh, Vengeance because with the, the movie opens with CJ and I doing a scene together. So to have, you know, to actually act with him, you know, in a scene was, was a lot of fun. It was, a, you know, it was a, it was a great 
a little scene and and a, you know and it kind of took my idea of Jason's father that I had in you know Jason lives and finally bring it to life on screen. Is there an uncut version of um, Friday the Thirteenth Part Six out there? No, there's there's um, on some of the uh, supplemental you know features there are some of the scenes that only we had a videotape copy of when we were screening it for the motion picture rating board. So there's, you can see some of the scenes with the additional footage in there, mm -hmm. but not, there's not a whole movie that kind of, you know, it has the uncut version. Part seven had far more problems with taken out because their effects and stuff are really huge. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know if they released one, but they should because, you know, uh, John Buechler did some amazing things in that movie. Yeah, they took a lot. I know for that one, they took a lot out of that with the gore. Yeah. Stuff, which, I don't, I mean, I guess back then it was way, obviously it was way different than it is now. Because now, so I feel like some of the stuff that they showed, and from, I'll just use 6 and 7 as an example, because you did 6 and we just brought up 7. But I feel like the, the gore that you see in those two now, that they cut out, they put that in regular TV shows now, and even more gore now on regular TV. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're just like, what's, how did this not pass? I mean, again, time, <laughs> times are different, but still, it just, the movie, part six was still an amazing, amazing movie, don't get me wrong, but I feel if it could have had, which it's not your guys' fault, it's a stupid ratings board, if it could have had that extra, that extra gore, it would have just took it to that next level of just... It's already a legendary movie. So it already has that legendary status. So, but it just, you know how it is. It would just, yeah. Because you got to see it, so you already know what we didn't get to see, what we didn't get to yes. see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 a tough thing when you you know. I tried to make all the kills sort of logical in the, in the way they're being executed, but because he's so super strong now you know, being brought back with lightning and things that I was able to take a little bit of a fantasy, you know, to it. So like, you know, when that one cop gets his head squished, mm. you know, all you hear is kind of a, a, a clack, a, you know, sound of the crack. And what we actually shot was you actually saw the skull crack open and you saw a piece of brain matter come up, you know. So, I mean, it was far yes, more tangible, you know. That's beautiful. That's beautiful art. See, I look at it as, like, just amazing art, and I'm the type of, uh, and I know, again, Henry's the same way. We're, like, the type of horror nerds where, like, if you get the Blu-rays and all that nowadays and you get the um, the deleted scenes or, like, how they did the special effects for the rare ones I do. Yeah, we'll, love that stuff. We will go there and just watch, like, wow. And I'm, the thing with me, and, again, I'm sure you're the same, I get so amazed how somebody can make, like, say, a fake head, for example. Take, I don't know how, I, again, I don't know anything about this, but I'm just throwing out a number there. Say it takes 20 hours to do this head to make it for a scene, and you're going to destroy it? I'm like, that That just amazes me. I'm just like, wow, you took all that. T I feel like if I took all that time to make something 20, 30 hours, I know it's for a movie, it. but it's like, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to destroy this now, but you have of to. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Well, sometimes they've got to make three or four of them, um, you know, just in case there's a problem, you know, yeah. if you're executing something and you know you chop off a head and it's supposed to go out a window but it misses and goes into the wall so <laughs> now you can't use that head you got to have another one you know for that moment so i mean but you know when you're working really low budget you know as as we were you know on ours mm -hmm. um you know a lot of the special effect things like when cj rams the spear you know towards lisbeth uh, we had one windshield so that had to work didn't have a backup for that you know the motor home obviously when that took off we yeah. were afraid it was going to hit that ramp and and not kill this guy you know because we could only do it once so there's lots of times where you really have to hope and pray that everything comes out as you you, you want it to and you know with any kind of visual effects or makeup effects um it can either be way too much blood or not enough you know you're trying to find that right level that's sort of believable yet really intense like a happy medium yeah see and that the scene you just mentioned with the rv that was like one of my favorite scenes in that movie just i think what what really set it off the top for me with that was when after the rv flips and then the door flips open kicks open you see jason coming out he just stands there for a second that yeah. was so freaking 
That was such a powerful moment in that movie for me. I'm just like, that yeah. was awesome. Damn, this guy is strong. Especially, yeah. especially seeing that for the first time as a kid. I'm just like, what? you don't believe your eyes. I'm like, wow. Yeah, right, right. yeah it's, it, it's, sort of, it, it's weird because it becomes sort of symbolic of him and what he does. And instead of it just being, a, you know, a human that he's standing over, you know, this motorhome was almost like a dinosaur and he was like a caveman and he <laughs> conquered the dinosaur and he yeah. stands atop it like, you know, I am, I am superior. And it's sort of in a, you know, completely subconscious way. It, it has that kind of power about it and the fire around the bottom of it and stuff. And I knew as I was you know, writing that thing exactly what it needed to look like. And we were very fortunate to be able to get it. You know, I tried to create about three or four iconic shots like that in my new Friday the 13th oh, as well, man. because they're, they're the things that sort of kind of exist as like a, just an image, you know, that, that is powerful. And, you know, it's a great way to end the sequence with, uh, you know, something that really, you know, brings home the whole idea of the character and what the movie is about. Listen. Yeah, and I feel like each each uh, Friday the Thirteenth has a, a moment that stands out. Oh yeah. You know, like with this one being the RV, and then the original one when you find out it was the mom the whole time. You know. Um, so yeah, um, for me, one of one of my favorites obviously is the RV, but the other one was the um, the sleeping bag kill against the tree. Oh, part seven. Yeah, because like when when I was a kid, you know, like you you hide under the blanket and the monster goes away. Yeah. But not this time. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> you can't hide in an RV either. You're you're not you're no good. You Fuck. Can't hide anywhere from Jason. It's funny you mentioned that though, Henry. I had last week I was talking about this on a podcast, and I was like, it's funny how as a kid when you're scared, you run up the stairs to hide under the blanket. I'm like, that's really not gonna. Thinking about it logically as an adult, that's not gonna do anything at all. <laughs> but but. Jason Lives was the movie that solidified the fact that he doesn't kill kids. Yeah, that's true. And I was still scared. Even though I would have been fine. Even though he doesn't exist. But, you know, he's a kid, six, seven years old. You know, that's your he's going to kill me. But no, he doesn't kill kids. Not yeah. Well, yeah, I'm did, glad. They, they really did nothing. And, and when he drowned, he was a kid himself. So, right. you know, I mean, I guess he could go after the ones that were the bully or the ones that might have teased him. But it's more about that the camp counselors weren't watching him, weren't keeping an eye on him. And he needed that, which is what obviously set his mother off. Yes, yeah, like, he's like, even though he's a big monster or what have you, he's still, at the most part, a kid at heart, you know. Yep. Just like in that movie, uh, did you see Dolls? Uh-huh. Remember at the end where uh, the one, the jester gave that little speech, you know, he was like, You're, he's a kid at heart. That's why they didn't kill the, the goofy, lovable guy in that movie, you know? Yeah. And it's kind of like that with Jason, like, you know, he's still a kid at heart and he's not going to kill kids because, you know, he kinda still is kind of one, you know, a, at his core. A big, strong ass kid that can kill. Well, yeah, yeah, unfortunate looking, but, you know, that's what the mask is for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is there anything else I can uh, uh, answer for you guys? You got anything else? The, open, the opening sequence. The opening sequence? Yeah. We're, you know, we, you, you had Tommy Jarvis. Like, right off the bat, you hear the name Tommy Jarvis. You're like, oh, man, something, something's going to happen here. Yeah. You know. Um, did you did you want the opening sequence? Did it come out the way you wanted it to come out? Because I, lo I love it. Like, it's a really good opening for a film. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's pretty much exactly as as written and as I storyboarded it um, with a storyboard artist um, that it had all these kind of key elements of setting up, you know, Tommy there. They, they've left the, um, you know, the uh, asylum where they were, you know, there, um, you know, he had a sidekick, Haas, who's named after <laughs> my best friend, Mike Haas, and um you know, and the roadkill there kind of set up an ominous, you know, thing about what's to come. And then, yeah, just the whole kind of bombastic coming to the place with a storm happening and, and digging up the body. Um, and then, of course, once he finally sees the body, he just goes, you know, ape shit and, uh, you know, killed. causes causes the, you know, the situation where the, the lightning bolt ends up connecting with that and brings him back. And then, all the yeah, all the touches, the maggots, the 
you know, him throwing gasoline on it, lighting the match, but then it starts to rain and puts out the match. You know, all <laughs> this still tries to light it and it's raining. Yeah. And then, you know, of course, the big thing was the fact that he puts on the mask and turns towards us. Yes. In this kind of, again, iconic stance. And then we move into his eye, and then I kind of do the James Bond satire. Yes, which was awesome. Yeah. Yep, yep. But yeah, like I said, in my opinion, it was a, an excellent opening for a film. Like, all right, it's like, all right, like when he turns around and faces the screen, it's like, all right, it's only downhill from here. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Or up, uphill for Jason. <laughs> I will say, great choice on the 77 Camaro. Huge muscle car fan, so that was a beautiful yeah. car to have in that movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. Me too. Me too. I know. That had to have the chick drive a hot car, right? You did. And I was just telling my wife, because we were watching it last weekend. We did a podcast on it. And the part where Tommy has his head down in her crotch, she said, be careful. It's about to be a hairy turn. As a kid, yeah. I did not know what the hell she was talking about. <laughs> I just yeah, because I was watching this yesterday, yeah. yeah. I just laughed because yeah. the adults were laughing, but now I'm like, oh, I get it, I get it. Yeah, yeah, cheap humor, but so you know, I, I had to go. I, see, I, I don't mind I don't mind humor in horror movies, even in Friday the 13th movies, as long as it's not too much. Like, the humor in this movie, it, everywhere you had it, it fit for the scene. Like, it wasn't overly done. It didn't feel forced. It just fit. It felt natural, which was just perfect. Yeah, I mean, some of it I try to be subtle and have just, you know, certain people get the joke, mm -hmm. uh, like the little kid that fell asleep reading No Exit. You know, I mean, to, you know, we had a screening of the movie about a half a year ago, and I mean, the whole audience burst into applause at that moment. It, you know, obviously it was one of their favorite, you know, jokes mm -hmm. uh, in, in the movie. And then, the, you know, the boy saying, so what were you going to be when you grew up? <laughs> you yep. know, things like that. It's like... <laughs> It you know it, they could say something like that, but for me it was like a little rascals moment, you know. Yeah. Where the, the kids say something very surprising. It was it was great, and you you did an excellent job with this movie. Yes. I myself really hope that this um, the lawsuit ends. You get to do your other movie, and I just I'm excited for. It. I'm really excited for the future of the franchise, and I think that if your movie can come out, it's going to really give this franchise a huge, huge boost that it needs. Well, what, like I, a, you know, what fresh, I tried to do guys, was to, to write a Friday the 13th that I wanted to see as a fan. You know, now, of course, I'm a very hardcore fan for this, this, the series and, and been, you know, thinking for literally 30-something years about... If I'm going to do another one of these, it's got to be really special and really fun. You know, a mm -hmm. thrill ride and, you know, the gore aspect and the, all the things that, you know, you want from a Friday, you know, make sure it has all that. And, and surprise people, too, along the way, certain things that you didn't expect. So, I mean, I, I feel very strongly that the piece is you know, going to be a, a real winner for, for people who love the genre. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm, again, a huge fan. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Yeah. It's like a, a childhood. This is, you know, I've been a fan of these movies since my childhood. So this is like a, I would say a childhood dream, but there was no such thing as podcast when I was a kid. But yeah. if there was, this is a childhood dream. So thank you so much. Well, it's, it's great that technology you know, can bring us all together. Yes. Which is wonderful. Yeah, you know, you created a something, you know, you created something that's a part of our childhood, you know, that we still care for you know as adults yeah definitely and i feel i'm still living my childhood uh, even better. That's awesome. even better. <laughs> so, and, so real quick um other than obviously the one you made what you said your favorite one was the first one or the second one? uh the first one just because it was a really great you know horror movie and uh, and the first time we saw those kinds of effects but in terms of once Jason kind of, you know, came on the scene, um, the final chapter, part four, is my favorite. I think Joe Zito made a really good film in, in the context of, you know, making a Friday the 13th and basically saying, well, this is going to be it. And they kind of thought it might be, you know, but it, then it did so well that they said, oh, fuck it. Know, a new beginning. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm glad they kept it going. So glad they kept yeah. it going. Yeah. Is there, anything, All right, guys. is there anything you want to plug, Tom, before you get off? Um, well, I've already kind of, you know, mentioned my band. Um, yeah, the the, uh, 
the sloths, you know, go on YouTube, guys, <laughs> yeah, and, you know, yeah. just look up the sloths, like those cute little furry creatures, but we're not. Um, and so there's an album, Back from the Grave, that is available on iTunes and Spotify and, you know, all the usual places. And then there's, if you actually find me at all of interest, there's a book that Joe Madri did um, that's out called uh, A Strange Idea of Entertainment, Conversations with Tom McLaughlin. And he basically took me from birth all the way up to, you know, about two years ago when I was began teaching at the college. And it's really all the kind of, if you love the, you know, movies, you know, how how we made certain ones, what the actors were like. You know, there's obviously a big section on Friday the 13th. And the special thing that's in the back of that book is the actual treatment that I wrote for the Friday the 13th. And you can see how close the movie was to that first, you know, impulse of what I wanted the story to be. Nice. And what's, what's the title again so I can write it down? Um, it's the line that the caretaker, the graveyard caretaker says when he looks at the camera, you know, a strange idea of entertainment. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so, so much for coming on again. Hopefully we can do this again one day down the road when your other movie comes yep. out. Hopefully we see you at a, a con one of these days. I'm going yep, um, to I'm gonna reach out to JV. That would be great. I messaged you his, e- I messaged you his email, and I'm going to message him, and I have no idea how any of this stuff works. But we really hope to see you at a con one day. Okay. I'll, yes. I'm, I'm going to keep keep on trying. I'll get there. Awesome. awesome. All right, man. Thank you guys so much. Thank you too. Thanks, thanks for coming on. We really appreciate it. Okay. Have a good Over one. Out. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, you know where to find me Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, anywhere you listen to podcasts. I'm on all those platforms. I have the Facebook group and the Facebook page. Come check me out on there. If you ever, ever want to be a guest, Shoot me an email, horrorwithsir.sturdy. Again, it's horrorwithsir.sturdy at gmail.com. Henry, thanks again for coming on. Had a good time. Yeah. And, and I'm glad I was able to do it. Oh, hell yeah. Me too. That it got me out of having to go to a birthday party too, so it's a double win. That's recorded. Good thing your wife doesn't listen to this podcast, though. <laughs> no. No. I want to go. But uh, as always, I'll see you.